Welcome to the ACM SIGGRAPH Frontiers uh, session. This is a brand new program here for SIGGRAPH. Um, we had conversations a few years ago about how do we expand our reach and how do we better interconnect our audiences. Uh, sometimes when you attend a conference and you see a panel session, it feels a little one and done, right? You see them and then you go home. Um, but one of our goals here is to better engage our audiences and our speakers. We do have a Facebook page called ACM SIGGRAPH Frontiers. Uh, this session is being recorded and we post it online and it allows you to continue the conversation with not only our presenters but also each other on this topic and anything slightly related. Um, ideally, those conversations over the course of the next year will inspire some of the topics for year three of this program. Um, so, housekeeping. Who enjoyed our earthquake the other day? <laughs> so, welcome to California. We have earthquakes. Uh, this is actually a very safe building. Uh, in the event that you feel the ground moving, um, you're not lightheaded, the ground is actually moving. Um, you want to stay put, uh, duck and cover if you can, but you're safest in this room. Uh, running out, especially out to the outside areas where there's a lot of glass and debris that may fall, is less safe. In the event that we need to evacuate, we'll get an announcement, an all uh, building announcement. So otherwise, uh, just please stay put. We have coffee and tea outside. Please help yourself as we kick this off. Um, last year during this session, um, AJ there, um, who this is his area of study for his PhD now, uh, he said, MK, if we need to convince people that the Earth isn't flat, scientists are doing a bad job. Scientists are poorly communicating if that is a conversation we have to have time and time again. So we got really interested in how are scientists communicating? Extremely complicated topics, data rich. How do you visualize that? How do you communicate that to the masses? So then AGI and I became fascinated by, is, is anyone a fan of Dancer PhD? Google that, it's amazing. Uh, it's PhD students partnered with world-class dancers interpreting their work uh, visually. Um, there's every year there's a contest on how to communicate scientific principles through PEEPS dioramas. Um, PEEPS are Easter candy. Um, so there's lots of different ways that people have attempted to do this. Um, Dan Goods here from the JPL lab with NASA has been studying this for years. Um, it's called visual strategy, it's JPL, and how do you take massive amounts of uh, any data, uh, NASA scientific data in particular, but how do you communicate that in such a way um, so that it communicates to a more broad audience? Uh, we wanted a chance again for this theme of engagement. We're calling this a fireside chat. There's your fire. Um, this is more of a conversation where AJ will be interviewing Dan, and also you are welcome to participate as well. So we have a mic for questions. We're a nice small group um, if you want to just stand up and shout real loud. So I'm going to hand this off to the gentleman. And this is the coolest room of dorky t-shirts of the week. Um, his is by far the dorkiest. It's the Titan. He's captain of the Titan rowing team. Google it. <laughs> Wait, what does it say below that? So uh, it says uh, liquid hydrocarbon racing. So uh, Titan is a moon of Saturn, and uh, it happens to have uh, liquid hydrocarbon uh, lakes. And so wouldn't it be really cool to uh, to row on it? So at JPL, we, we created these clubs and societies of the future. This is one of the clubs and societies of the future. We also have the Proud to be Human uh, Club. Uh, we also have the Earth bumper sticker, so it's the European sort of symbol, uh, like a car bumper sticker that you would see, but it has a big E on it, so you could put that on your future spacecraft. <laughs> That's a level of dorkiness yeah. we all aspire to. <laughs> Uh, so thanks everyone for being here. Um, I pre-apologize, I've already lost my voice at the conference, so I'm gonna speak low and slow into the microphone. Um, so my, my, my name's AJ Christensen. Uh, my background is scientific visualization, and uh, as MK mentioned, I've been really passionate about communicating science uh, through art and creativity for a while now. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to interview Dan Goods today because this is his career. Um, Dan graduated with a degree in graphic design from the Art Center College of Design. In 2012, he was selected as one of the most interesting people in Los Angeles by the LA Weekly. Dan now leads a team called The Studio as a visual strategist for NASA at its Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he finds clever ways to drive art with data. Uh, can everyone welcome Dan Goods? <laughs> Thank you. 
So uh, I'll just go ahead and launch into some questions here, and, and I'll ask a few and then kind of throw it to the audience, so please start preparing your own questions. Um, how does a designer starting out get to work with scientists, and how much science did you know before starting at NASA? Um, very little. So let's see. So I went to this uh, school called the Art Center College of Design, and I remember driving down from Seattle, because I used to live in Seattle, and, and I was um, getting ready to go to the school, and there's two signs on the freeway, and one said Art Center College of Design, and like right next to it, it said NASA JPL. I was like, wow, this is really fascinating. I, I have no idea exactly what they do, but it sounds really cool. Um, I ended up going into a lecture class at Art Center. It wasn't my class, but uh, it is an er interesting talk by a guy named David Kremers, who uh, is a fine artist, but he was working with a scientist at Caltech. And uh, what, he, what he talked about was new ways of visualizing lots of data, and I was just fascinated by what he was doing, not only what he was doing, but the content of what he was doing. Uh, I wanted to get into branding before. Uh, I thought I was gonna work at some big you know, uh, agency or something like that. But after hearing that, I, I ended up getting to do an internship with him at Caltech. And um, I was just blown away by the big ideas of, of science. And I wanted to somehow work at a research center. But uh, that's not really a, Possible, you know, when you go to the career counselor, they don't say, "Oh, you know, work at Nike, work at uh, you know New York Times, work at you know uh, research center." Um, so I had to work really hard to find and talk to the right people. And um, by happenstance, I ended up getting to meet the director of the Jet Propulsion Lab. And uh, through a series of events, um, they gave me six months, <laughs> and that was 16 years ago. Um, and so, really, I had no. I, I had a great respect and a great admiration of the ideas of, of science, but um, you know, I, math and physics wasn't my, my thing. So how, how much do you feel like you've learned since starting the job? <laughs> um, a lot. I mean, well, you know, I'm not a person that um, maybe knows it super deep, but I know enough to talk about what the essence is. and. Um, but yeah, I, I know a bunch, you know, like I will laugh at something geeky like the, you know, Titan Rowing Club. And so obviously I've kind of gone down a rabbit hole. So uh, do, do you feel like that kind of helps you in communicating with the public, sort of not coming from this background of, of like being an astrophysicist? <laughs> Definitely, because um, I think everyone, every field, you know, we, we all kind of start to use a language that departs from normal English and um, you know everyday talk and, and you start to build this whole community that no one else understands and uh, you need people to poke at that and, and ask so what no what do you really mean by that oh yeah this is what I mean why didn't you just say that oh well it's because we like to use these big words you know, that no one else understands so do you get to then like sort of have that conversation with experts at NASA all the time sort yeah of? Filtering it. <laughs> um, so I was super intimidated. Uh, when I was in high school, I got like a 296. I slept through two of my classes. I never took the SATs. You know, I went to an art school, and here I was with super smart people. And I remember going to, uh, you know, these various presentations, and, and I'd just be like, I have no idea what they're talking about. And I'd leave, and I'd tell my, you know, call, you know the person next to me, like, yeah, I had no idea what they're talking about. And they sometimes would also say, yeah, I have no idea what they were talking about either. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? I thought you guys are all supposed to understand what each other's talking about. But, um, you know, when you've been the smartest person forever and now you're in the big pool of smart people, maybe you're a little intimidated to ask, you know, the question that may not be the most profound. Um, but I found that the most profound thinkers at JPL were are the ones that ask the simplest questions. Because like, um, I've noticed that people would get really far into the weeds and then uh, someone would pull back and say, so why in the world are you even doing that? You know, and they're like, well, I, just, I well, you know, <laughs> and then it turns out maybe they shouldn't have been doing that, you know? <laughs> and yeah. so it didn't matter how deep in the weeds they got, they were going down the wrong path to begin with. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, that's maybe a good transition into just, uh, you know, how do you, 
how do you feel as an artist in a in an environment that's largely scientist or do you do you feel different or do you feel well integrated into that culture uh so jpl is a big place uh there's like seven thousand people there i actually have a well kind of show the picture real fast so uh this is jpl <laughs> and um so it's like a little city and you know, there's stereotypes of scientists and engineers, and some of them are true, and many of them are not. Uh, I find that, so at JPL, most of them are engineers. So if you have like a few hundred scientists, four or 500 scientists, you have 4,000 engineers, because the scientists will ask a big question, and then you need all these people to figure out how to actually accomplish answering that question. So uh, many of the scientists I, I feel a real bond with because they tend to be really big, wild thinkers and they're, they're asking crazy questions and, and they're so smart you know, I, I, and, and creative that I usually feel like I don't really have good ideas. Um, sometimes I feel like just us being in the room though gives them permission to throw out crazier ideas because they're like, oh, well, we're with the artists, you know, we, we can do whatever. Whereas if they're with all their peers, then there's a little bit more, oh, they're my peers, you know, that type of thing. Um, there are different kinds of engineers. Um, they're the engineers of the crazy thinkers at the beginning of the process. And then there's the engineers that, that um, are going to make sure this thing works. And they want to know every single, you know, uh, they, they ask you, what are my requirements? You know, and, and the other people don't ask about requirements. They just kind of ask about crazy ideas. And so the ones that ask about requirements tend to be, you know, a different kind of person. And so, uh, but really it, it's been a great experience being there. When I was first there, people were wondering, you know, should we, should we have someone like this around? Why shouldn't we just have another engineer? And, and now um, we have a great team and people wait six months to work with us. And so I feel like uh, they, they want to be with us and they appreciate what we bring to the table. Yeah. So, um, so you're, you're kind of a special kind of artist too. In, like your, your media is maybe less, uh, you know, paper and, and ink than it is um, data, right? Uh, so, so what I really want to ask you is, is uh, where you kind of see yourself fitting in the art community. Uh, but before we get there, maybe it's worth describing kind of what it means for you to work with data to create art at, at all? <laughs> well, so um, to start with, like, uh, the whole word of artist is something sort of um, unusual for me. So graphic design, that's a commercial art. Uh, I don't really care if you call it art or design or something else. And what, what I care about is does it make you feel? Does it connect with you in some way? And so I don't really connect all that well with the art world <laughs> and I don't always connect well with the graphic design world um, I just I want to connect with the rest of the people you know and uh, and data is just one area in which um, I've been interested in uh, for some time and and just trying to think about you know there are ways of visualizing data and then there's ways of experiencing data and so just asking that different question of experience versus looking at uh, can maybe broaden opportunities. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about your process of working with data? Like how do you, how do you take a big pile of numbers and turn <laughs> it into an experience? Yeah, well, uh, a lot of it depends on, I'm always trying to find what is the essence of either a, a, con a scientific concept or a place or a person and try to express that in an interesting way. And so, I don't usually actually, I mean, if I start with the data set, I, I'm asking questions like, well, why, why do we have this data set? You know, why is it important? Uh, what does it mean? What if we didn't have it? Um, but it's really asking the question of what is the essence of that? And then I usually work off of, off, off of that and, yeah. and trying to think about, well, what are, what are interesting ways of showing that or uh, giving people an experience that uh, gives them a different perspective? Yeah. So I know you brought a few examples uh, with you, so uh, sure. maybe maybe this would be a good time to sort of share with the audience some, some ideas of, of what we're talking about, kind of the way these have been realized. Yeah, um, so uh, first off, uh, have an awesome team. 
uh, people from lots of different backgrounds, and we work with lots of freelancers and um, uh, other artists that are out there uh, or technical people to help us accomplish things. Um, the first project, uh, this isn't as much like data viz, but it's something you guys, some people may have seen before. We put together a bunch of these travel posters from uh, places not from Earth. And so we tried to be like uh, travel agents, trying to get people to go to these locations. So these are all real, real places, but most, these are just like dots in the data, <laughs> really. So, so like there's not an actual picture. There's just like literally one pixel. And then the scientists say, oh, well, I think this is a, a planet that's like styrofoam or this, this place is like that. And um, so we were really trying to figure out what is special about these different places. And there's a lot of work that went on behind all this. We, we spent lots of time brainstorming with, uh, with scientists, engineers, the person who delivers the mail, uh, people that are good at um, communicating science. And uh, David Delgado, uh, a colleague of mine, he really sort of ran this, this project. And so this is one of my funnest, uh, my favorite ones because it's a planet that doesn't have a sun. And uh, the scientists were like, oh, we can't do that one because like who would want to go to a planet that doesn't have a sun? Well, we're trying to make a negative a positive. And so we came up with this uh, uh, punchline where the nightlife never ends, right? And so that's why you go to this place. They would, would put together this sort of style board. Uh, Joby Harris is an amazing illustrator on our team and he would start to do sketches and he would do you know, lots and lots of these things. And eventually we would end up with, with a poster. Um, but uh, there's a whole bunch of these things. They're free online. Uh, you can print them out 10 feet tall. Um, lots of people, there's a whole underground world where people take NASA stuff and take get rid of the NASA logo and sell it and so you can buy kind of pretty much anything you can get a whiskey flask um, but at the end of the day this is this is what I'm what I love is when you actually move people in some way and this person was very very open with you know that they're going to start trying to have a baby very very soon so <laughs> um, this is David and him and I uh, went out to a place called Goldstone. Has anyone ever heard of Goldstone? It's on the way to Las Vegas. And uh, at this particular time in history, JPL or NASA had an airplane that would fly uh, to a few different places. And we went out there and they have these giant antennas. And these antennas are what speak, speak to the spacecraft that are at the moon or beyond. So this is part of what's called the Deep Space Network. There's three locations, one's in Australia, one's in Spain, one's in, in uh, in this place called Goldstone. And so as the Earth spins, we can always be speaking to spacecraft. And there's about 40 of them that are out there that are at the moon or beyond. And uh, some of them are from NASA, some are from the European Space Agency, some are from uh, uh, Japanese and the um, uh, Indian Space Agency. And with these giant antennas, it was just kind of a weird spot out there where it's super quiet in the desert and you see these giant antennas and they just kind of barely move and but they're speaking to these things that are impossibly far away right and so um had this moment where i was thinking well wouldn't it be cool if you could listen to where these spacecraft are and unfortunately right after we got done with the trip all this funding got canceled and uh, it was just an idea for a long long time <laughs> uh so Fast forward like 12 years later, I uh, had an opportunity to do an installation in New York at, a, at the World Science Festival. And so we thought, well, what if we gave a voice, a sound, to each of the different satellites that NASA has that study the Earth? Most people don't know that NASA studies the Earth. At SIGGRAPH, you know, people see the videos so they, they know that. And so um, we ended up working with an amazing sound composer, um, uh, Shane Mirbeck and he gave a voice to each of these different 19 satellites that NASA has that study the Earth. And he created this ambisonic sound system so we could place a sound anywhere within a room. And then we worked with an amazing architect uh, from, uh, uh, from Brooklyn, uh, Jason Klamoski, and he came up with this idea of a seashell. So seashell, you can listen to the ocean, but in our seashell, you can listen to the location of satellites. So when you walk inside, when you stand in the very center, wherever you hear a sound, if you hear a sound there,
that's the exact location of a satellite right now. And then you'd hear another sound over there, another sound over there. And there's a little iPad that tells you which one you're listening to at that moment. Obviously, we don't have an Amazon sound system in here, but it's it's uh, really cool to be able to localize all, all the different sounds. And what was fun about this one was uh, a lot of data things are very frenetic, right? And this is a place that people actually bring their kids to lull them to sleep. <laughs> and you'll go in there and people will be in there with their eyes closed. And it's, it's really, it's, it's wonderful to be able to make a connection on a, on a different level where where they just want to you know exist and, and know where these things are and that's not like an everyday type of activity so so that's actually I, I know that some of your work uh, you you really focus on like sort of being emotionally aware uh, and trying to engage your audience's emotions so can you maybe talk more about like your goals in terms of of reaching people you know like in different parts of their brain mm-hmm well, you know, we all learn differently and we all react differently. Some people are very analytic and others are very emotional. Um, I think NASA does a great job because it is a very analytical institution um, to do things with, you know, facts and figures, but not everyone is moved by that. And um, there's a whole other crowd of people that um, we, we spend your taxpayer money that we should be speaking to you as, as well. And even the analytical people, they have emotions too. So <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, but, wow. but um, that is true as well. <laughs> so uh, this might be a good time to kind of open up the, the audience microphone. Is there anyone out there who would like to jump into this conversation? I'll just show one more while you're waiting to come to the thing here. This is, uh, this is at JPL. So this is the room where all the data from all the spacecraft that are at the moon or beyond goes to. Uh, so this is our sort of mission control. And I get a live feed from that room and uh, it feeds this sculpture. And the sculpture uh, responds to all the data going through that room. So as lights come down, we're receiving data. When lights go up, we're sending data and the amount of data is represented by how much light is, uh, is there. So some spacecraft have tons of data. Uh, other spacecraft like Voyager, it's beyond the edge of the solar system. It can hardly send any data back and forth. So it actually looks like it's broken most of the time. Uh, it's out, in fact, yesterday, we, we get data back every day from Voyager uh, 1 or 2. And uh, it's like, oh, there's Voyager data. And they're like, where? <laughs> but then you just have to wait for a little bit for the next one to pop up. We do have a mic in the middle of the room here for questions, and as I saw there's a gentleman who raised his hand, so we get you. It's also impossible to see you from up here because there's a giant um, <laughs> space lights blinding us, but I can see a gentleman in a green shirt at the mic, so off you go. How you doing? Thank you for your talk. Um, you just mentioned uh, how difficult, or really uh, how scientists think analytically oftentimes. Um, is how would you? How do you approach convincing them that uh, an emotional or visual um, solution can uh, can aid in the communication of a, of a idea? Yeah. Well, I think when uh, like those travel posters, it was really hard for them to. Originally, we said, "Oh, let's do posters," and they're like, "Great! Here's the spacecraft," you know, and. Uh, you know, if you've seen one spacecraft, you've sort of seen many of them, you know, uh, for many people out in the world. They're a bunch of boxes in, in some fashion. And we're like, no, you gotta like, you gotta help people see where they could someday go. And they're like, ah, oh, no, no, I don't know about that. And then, and then uh, even, even one of my favorite people there was not really into it. Um, and it was really only meant for the walls at, at uh, JPL. It was not meant to be released. And uh, somehow it got to a conference and like there are lines out the door, people wanting these posters and the NASA got all upset and they're like, you didn't get approval for these. And then they're like, oh, uh, these are great posters. These are wonderful. <laughs> um, but now, uh, I can go anywhere in the world and there'll be someone that says that I have those on my wall and, and the scientists have that same thing. So everywhere they go in the world, you know, they say, I got those 
those posters, you know? And, and then they're like, wow, this really means something, <laughs> you know? And so I think, um, you know, once they, once they're, uh, it gets out there, then they, they, they see the excitement from people about the thing that they're working on, right? And, and uh, cause they're really trying to tell people, cause they'll show little chart, you know, like line drawings that to the rest of the world mean nothing, but to them it's like, like, you know, it's, it's amazing, but uh, no, you know, very few people understand what that little squiggly line means. It can, yeah, this is just making me think, like I know a lot of times when, when we work with data, there's kind of this sense of like, you have to be 100% mm. accurate to the data and don't extrapolate. Like mm -hmm. don't, don't try to guess something sure. or, or uh, uh, you know, mislead your audience. Mm -hmm. um, and we fight back against that because, uh, you know, there might be a value to like inspiring people or getting their imagination working. So I wonder if you have some comments yeah. on that. Well, I never want to mislead anybody. Um, so that's really important to me. It's not always important to other people that do this. <laughs> so perhaps um, there's a bad rap there because uh, some people just don't care, right? And they're like, I just want to... I just want you to feel, so I, don't, I don't want this to feel like I'm saying, I just want you to feel something, it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. Because uh, I really, really do care about the real information getting out there. So everything we do is, you know, we, we get fact checked and, and all that sort of stuff. But there is there's a level of detail that um, at some point doesn't, you know, parsing hairs isn't gonna help your cause. And uh, so we, we, we really care about being clear and compelling. And, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes we do err on the poetic side. Uh, we, we call this sneaking up on learning. I uh, love that phrase because it's, it's, um, it's drawing someone to something. And then when they're there, they're asking lots of questions. And uh, that's a much, to me, that's a much more natural way of learning than saying, I'm gonna teach you something. Right, and so if you can sneak up on their, that learning. But yeah, again, it is it is important that uh, everything that we do, especially at NASA, is not, uh, does not seem as if it's, um, it's just made up, you know? So everything that we show is things that we, we said, hey, is, could this thing happen? Could that thing happen? So it doesn't necessarily mean that it is true because every five minutes they rethink what an exoplanet is like, and so, this is a point in time, and we're doing what's at this point in time. Yeah. yeah. We have another gentleman at the mic there. Uh, you mentioned uh, that when engineers have a graphic designer in the room, that um, they are they feel that they can uh, express crazier ideas. Uh, can you think of a, an example where that sort of perceived license to be creative has fed back into the engineering process and, and resulted in a, a change to the way they work? Yeah, I mean, I wish I had lots of, um, wish I had data, a data viz of saying, oh, because of this, that, the other thing happened. Um, all I can say is that um, people keep coming back. And so really the way we work, there isn't, it, uh, imagine we have a small team, uh, a small business within a city, uh, a small city. And so every single uh, thing that every hour of our day is built to a project that someone's willing to pay for. And um, so there's no like institutional funding that says that thou shalt have the studio. <laughs> um, and so to me that, that means a lot is that they keep coming back and they appreciate it. And um, you know, we've had the highest levels of NASA come and hang out with us. So, um, in fact, uh, it used to be that uh, the previous associate administrator who would be the highest civil servant person at NASA, uh, he spent a couple different uh, times with us and, and I wrote him up asking, well, was this beneficial to you? And, and he said, absolutely. And he kind of went on to some things, but he said at the end of the day, it reminded him why he worked at NASA. And, um, you know, that, that's important, especially when they're the leader of your organization. <laughs> Thank you. There is some really good data on why diversity in a room adds value to the brainstorming of the problem solving process. And part of it is, obviously, you have just different points of view. Um, but another really interesting part of that is people are just polite to each other. If they realize that, you know, the, the engineers aren't going to know their papyrus from their Palatino, 
Um, you take the time to explain that, and that's a value to everybody in the room. Um, on our ACM Secret Frontiers Facebook page, I will find some data and post that there if anyone wants to drill a little bit deeper than that. So, at the mic again there. Hi, you mentioned that 16 years ago they gave you six months. What were the success stories? How did you convince them, or how did you earn that place where now people are waiting six months to work <laughs> with you? Yeah, well, um, part of it was just diversity of projects. So, um, I I love the idea of graphic design being a problem solving um, career versus like I'm going to do posters or something like that. And so uh, when I first got there, I, I did have some free reign. They, they allowed me to kind of come up with some ideas. And one of the, one of the projects that I did was uh, I had a grain of sand and I had someone drill a hole into it. And the hole represented where we would found all these planets uh, within our galaxy. And uh, that went over really well. People uh, really enjoyed that. But you know, that only took me so far. Eventually, uh, we were trying to, we have to compete to win new missions. And uh, I worked with the, the main scientist and the whole team. There's like 100 people involved. And uh, we were pitching a billion dollar mission. And I was trying to help <clears throat> help the team communicate in ways that you know made sense and was compelling as, as well. And uh, they ended up winning. The spacecraft is at Jupiter right now. It's called Juno. It's taking amazing pictures. And uh, and they're like, oh wow, this is really important. You know, <laughs> maybe we need to hand around more for things like this. And and so I I was really fascinated with just being involved in every corner of JPL, whether it's security. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, two people that are cleared now to work in the classified area at JPL. Uh, we work with um, you know, uh, the very beginning uh, brainstorming of a brand new mission. Uh, we work with uh, the people who have science data that they're trying to tell people about it. We work with HR. We work with, you know, we uh, when there's a new building or a, a new uh, facility being renovated, we're involved in that. And we're also involved in when we try to pitch new missions. And so it, it's really been sort of uh, them going, oh, there's um, there's something else that you can do. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, but, and, and so um, what, what I love is sometimes people come to us and they have a specific thing, like, I want you to do this. And we'll be like, okay, we'll do that. Uh, other people come and say, well, I have a general area and I don't really know what to do. And then other people come in and they're like, I don't know why I'm here, but I feel like I should be. <laughs> Those are my favorite people. Yeah. Uh, if you're local or maybe flying for it, JPL does have an annual open house. Um, it was waylaid for a few years, but it's back. And they host 50,000 people. Um, over on that little campus there, if you're interested in going and touching and talking to folks in person next year. I have uh, two questions. One is the uh, seashell installation. Is that still there? Yeah. Where is it? So it's at the Huntington Gardens, which is not very far away from here. Um, it's probably 35 minutes away. And uh, it was only going to be there for three months, and it's been about three years now. So uh, we're hoping it just stays. It's, yeah, it, kind it's, of in, it's on the Pasadena San Reno border. It's a phenomenal uh, library and art collection. Yep. Uh, it's outdoors in the gardens, but also right this minute, the corpse flower is blooming oh, over there. Wow, yeah. So if you want to go um, Smell. see a flower that smells like <laughs> juicy fruit gum and death, um, and look at his installation, win win. <laughs> Just know that if you go to the Huntington Gardens, make sure you set aside like three hours because it's one of the most amazing places in the world. So outside of our thing. <laughs> we, we had a corpse uh, flower bloom at the Botanical Gardens in New York uh, last year. It's, a, it's definitely an experience. <laughs> My second question is, you mentioned that your goal is to be clear and compelling. And do you have a process for testing your ideas to see if it reaches that goal? <laughs> how do you figure out when you know, you have, it's refined to the point where you've achieved that goal? You show it to a lot of people that have no idea what you're working on. That's usually the best way to, <laughs> to do it. Does this make any sense? You know, um, so uh, yeah, like when we have our brainstorms, uh, or just you know, at JPL, there's a lot of people. Uh, they don't all know what each other's working on. So, but then we 
we like to go to people who have no association with space as well. And, and I, I do, so there's, there's sort of this tension inside me between clear, compelling, and poetic. And poetic is not always clear, right? And so um, sometimes we err on the poetic side because, because poetry stays with you. <laughs> um, sometimes we err on the side of clear because you just need to know the answer. One of my favorite uh, mentors, he said, if you're doing a emergency um, you know, map that goes on the side of the building, you don't want to be poetic with that. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, I wonder where I should be going in life. You know, you just need to get out. Um, but if you're doing something else, there's more room for that poetry. Great, thank you. Oh, hi. So, um, with the more non-conventional professions, um, I feel maybe one can find themselves in a position where they're maybe the only person in a firm or a company doing the thing. And uh, I'm assuming as a young professional, you might have found yourself in such a position. So in times like these, uh, did you ever sort of have to deal with imposter syndrome? If you did, how did you sort of go about that? And also, um, did you ever come across thoughts such as, um, you know, I could have been at Nike or like some of the other sort of uh, um, advertising firms and could have been getting better mentorship from the teams mm. over there as a graphic designer to, you know, better improve yourself. As yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I remember thinking about mentorship early on and what I'd be missing by being there because there wasn't anyone to mentor me. Um, but uh, there are lots of people outside of there that, especially at a place like JPL, I can really call anybody up in the world and they at least will, you know, answer. You know, they may not do anything with me later on, but um, they will at least answer. And so um, using, using that to the fullest, I can call up plenty of, you know, amazing designers and ask them questions. And, uh, but I think that's true. You know, anybody can call anybody up. And so um, if you're at a place that you're not getting mentorship, find mentorship. And um, you know, generally, there's good people out there to, to do that. Um, being, yeah, uh, uh, imposter syndrome, I think if, you, if you're honest, most people feel that whether or not they're at the top of their game or not. <laughs> you know? And so, um, uh, yeah, I think I just used it as I'm, I'm, in a, I'm exploring this weird landscape. Uh, JPL is just also a really weird place too. So there's uh, sort of in the 13th century and the 21st at the same time. And so I tried to do my best while I was there. Okay. But there, there, what is interesting is that there are tons of engineers and scientists who either wanted to be artists or have great affection towards it. And so they find you out. So if once, once they knew that I was there, people would sort of come around. So I'm, I'm gonna interrupt really quick because I, I know that you kind of want to talk about the, the High Juno project and I want to I want to frame it in a question uh, which is um, you know uh, MK man mentioned like we were having this conversation about flat earthers and like how could that possibly exist uh, so like you know in in a society where anti-science narratives are kind of taking hold across the political spectrum both liberals and conservatives kind of have uh, their own issues with this. Um, you know, what do you see as the value of, of making science fun uh, and entertaining? And, you know, like, is that anti, like, <laughs> anti-intellectual to, to, like, bring fun into the equation? I think everyone likes to have fun. I mean, it's hard when there's serious consequences, right? Like, so that, that's a hard thing. Um, I think, I think compelling, you have to have something compelling. Uh, right, these days, it's really hard to compete with cat videos and the Kardashians, right? It really, like, you just have no chance unless it's compelling in some particular way. And so I don't think it's a, um, you, you, you used words like entertainment and fun. Um, I would, you know, that may or may not be as worth, 
while, you know, depending on how it's done. But uh, being compelling, I don't think, is a choice anymore. You know, if you're going to get funding, you have to be compelling beyond just the um, you, your peers. So, um, I did um, want to show a quick little video, and I don't exactly know how much time we have, but. Um, uh, I'll be we happy have to. Three minutes. Oh, three, three minutes. minutes. This oh, gentleman wow. showed okay. up at seven to see you, so we're definitely getting okay. this question. Okay. But let's well, show our video. Uh, <coughs> the video is like four and a half minutes. So. We can post okay. it on our Facebook. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Well, um, you can find another talk of mine and see now it. Now he's so. teasing yeah. us. Yeah. I will forego yeah. my question to see the video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should I just go for he it? He sees the floor. Just yeah. go for it. So, um, so just. Um, we were trying to, the Juno spacecraft was going to come by the Earth um, to use a gravity assist to send it out, into, uh, out to Jupiter, and uh, this is what we did. Experiment is something that I <laughs> just came up with. The biggest challenge we had was we didn't know if this was going to work. If it works, you know, I'm part of history. <laughs> this is W6JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. I love CQ, CQ, CQ. Juno's way of gaining some extra speed, changing direction so that its orbit can take it to Jupiter. He said, what if we actually sent something to Juno? I basically came up with the idea that we could send Morse code to Juno, enlist the support of amateur radio operators around the world. is to join the amateur radio community together in a coordinated transmission from Earth to the Juno spacecraft as it flies by. The website would tell them, okay, key out now, key up, transmit for 30 seconds. And that's how we would send a dit. But he knows Morse code is dit 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 da da. Well, it turns out to say hi to Juno it takes four dits in space and then two dits for the eye. I thought, wow, that's a neat thing to do, and they're going to need a lot of people to pull this thing off. I said, I'm good to go. <laughs> We're getting ready right now. Here we go. And now we're transmitting here. Hear ham radio operators all over the world doing this, which was really remarkable. Everybody's doing this at the same time. Thousands and thousands of ham. With any luck, the Juno spacecraft will be able to listen and hear all these amateur radio transmissions. And so what we're doing now is we're looking at the data that's come down and see if we can put together that signal that says, hi, will it work? Who knows? from Juno. I'd love you to listen to it. This sounds very cool. Humankind has 
ability to think beyond our own environment. It's the curiosity, it's the adventuring spirit of it. The space program is good at this. I do know. 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 Why is it good? Okay, take 17. There's more about all the data and how we found it and the signal and the stuff on, on my website. So here, look. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it was almost a year ago today. Uh, we said, why wow, we need this man here? Why wow, we were right. Um, the next session in the ACM Cigarette Frontiers uh, talks is tomorrow morning. It's uh, right above us in Theater 411. It's Imaging the Black Hole the Event Horizon Telescope. That is going to be very, very crowded. If that's a topic you're interested in, be sure you get to Theater 411 about this tomorrow, well in advance of the 8 a.m. start time. And there will also be coffee and tea. So caffeinate yourself. Uh, have a great day. Check out our Facebook page, ACM Super Frontiers, where we'll have uh, some of the details on some of the data that I just shared. Have a great day.